It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. During the Integrity Commissioner's investigation into the Green Belt grab, the Premier's Chief of Staff, Patrick Sackville, said under oath that he did not discuss removal criteria with anyone until October 27, 2022. But late last year, we in the NDP obtained an email sent from the personal account of Ryan Amato to the personal account of Mr. Sackville discussing the removals and dated October 17, 10 days earlier, Speaker. So to the Premier, can the Premier explain this 10-day discrepancy in the testimony of his Chief of Staff to the Integrity Commissioner? And to reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, my understanding, of course, is that uh, the Chief of Staff has uh, reached out uh, to the Integrity Commissioner to uh, uh, ensure that uh, that there to highlight the fact that there is actually no uh, inconsistency with the uh, the testimony. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you. It, it doesn't add up clearly. This email was sent on the same day as a dramatic meeting between ministry staffers and the Premier's housing policy advisor, Jay Truesdell. You might recall, Speaker, that was called a train wreck of a meeting. Mr. Truesdell was learning about the Greenbelt scheme for the first time, and evidently what he heard alarmed him. Mr. Amato said Mr. Truesdell didn't know about the Greenbelt scheme because he was told, told to, and I quote, leave him in the dark. Unquote. According to the Integrity Commissioner, Mr. Amato identified Mr. Sackville as the, quote, decision maker in the Premier's office for this project, Speaker. So back to the Premier. Why did the Premier's Chief of Staff tell Mr. Amato to leave his own housing policy advisor in the dark? To respond, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, Mr. Speaker, uh, of course, the Integrity Commissioner has, uh, re has reviewed that. Mr. Sackville has uh, reached out to the uh, Integrity Commissioner to uh, uh, ensure that there uh, is no uh, confusion with respect to his testimony and that there, of course, is no uh, um, uh, change in, in, the, in the testimony in any way, shape, or form. There's no inconsistencies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. The final supplementary. Speaker, well, Speaker, uh, the NDP has obtained yet another uh, document showing that Mr. Amato sent an email later that evening asking for a meeting to get everyone on the same page following that same train wreck of a meeting earlier that day. The request was sent to several top staffers in the Premier's office, Speaker. According to this document that we've acquired, Mr. Sackville agreed a meeting was needed telling the group, and I'm going to quote, this is timely and critical, unquote. So I want to go back to the Premier again, Speaker. In addition to Mr. Sackville, how many other officials in the Premier's office discussed the Greenbelt scheme earlier than what they told the Integrity Commissioner? To respond, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, again, the Integrity Commissioner has, uh, has uh, reviewed and issued a report. At the same time, uh, uh, the Chief of Staff has uh, reached out to the Integrity Commissioner, has already reached out to the Integrity Commissioner to, uh, uh, to highlight uh, uh, some of the um, uh, uh, pronouncements made by the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition. There is no inconsistencies, and of course the Integrity Commissioner uh, has that and uh, will review it. The next question. Leader of the Opposition. I understand why they're hesitating to answer some of these questions. The RCMP is, of course, investigating them as well right now. This question is, is for the, uh, the Premier as well. Uh, speaker, this government was warned by the Auditor General back in 2021 that an over-reliance on international student tuition was going to put our post-secondary education sector in a very untenable financial position. There was a steady stream of warnings coming from colleges and universities and the government's own expert panel from us in the opposition about the serious financial risk that they were facing because of the lack of funding. Speaker. Even uh, the Minister of Colleges and Universities has claimed she wasn't even aware a cap on international students was coming. It defies belief, Speaker. Speaker, back to the Premier. Was the Minister asleep Question. at the wheel here, 
or did she look the other way while private Order. career colleges massively exploited Order. the international student program? Order. Mr. College of Universities to reply. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the, uh, the member of the opposition for that question. And that is correct. Quite frankly, we are very disappointed in the federal decision that was made with unilateral decision, without consultations with the provinces or any of the post-secondary institutions. We are working very closely with our institutions right now, but I can tell you this is going to be a, an economic hit across uh, not only Ontario, but across Canada. And that's what we were hearing from, from many different organizations. I talked to the Tourism Association during the Roma conference and heard from them directly the impact that they foresee happening in the hospita hospitality and tourism industry in Ontario. As I've said, the, the Premier and the Prime Minister signed a historic health care deal. We need to ensure that we have enough PSWs to fill those spaces for the Minister of Long-Term Care, enough nurses in this province for the Ministry of Health. Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue working very closely with our partners, and we will have uh, more to say by March 31st deadline. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I will, I will remind the minister that under their watch, one university went bankrupt, and now nearly half of our universities are reporting multi-million dollar deficits under this government's watch. Speaker, the minister and this government knew exactly what they were doing by undermining the public colleges and universities to open the door to for-profit diploma mills. That's what they were doing. Last week, we learned that those same colleges were making major donations, Speaker, to the minister's re-election campaign. So back to the Premier. Is this yet another case of wealthy donors and insiders shopping for policy changes behind closed doors? Members will please take their seat. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, unilateral decision made without consultation to the provinces and to the provinces as well as the sector in this in this province. I've heard extreme dissatisfaction from many institutions, but more importantly, the economic impact this is going to have on Canada and Ontario. The Minister of Economic Development, he is bringing new, co new uh, companies here to Ontario every single week. And guess one of the reasons they come here is because of the talented pipeline of students that we have in this province. I make, you know, I will continue to work with our institutions, and we will be addressing uh, this by the March 31st deadline. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, it seems like everything has to be pushed to the absolute breaking point before this government chooses to do anything at all. It's students and families that are paying a huge price for this government's failure. They're relying on food banks. They're juggling multiple jobs just to make rent. I've talked to families who are seriously questioning whether they can send their child to college. But instead of bringing forward the funding, the minister responsible was busy funding her own campaign. Shame. Bringing in over $24,000 in a single night from directors and executives of those very same private colleges. So, Speaker, back to the Premier again. Will there be any consequences for this minister, or does he approve of this return to Liberal style cash for access fundraising in Ontario? Once again, caution the Leader of the Opposition on her choice of words. And to reply, the uh, Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And may I remind the whole House, under Liberal leadership, tuition in this province rose. It was the highest tuition in all of Canada. Under the leadership of Premier Ford in 2019, we decreased tuition by 10 per cent. And may I remind the opposition, they voted against that initiative to make education affordable for students in this province. Mr. Pre or Mr. Uh, Speaker, the Premier announced an additional tuition freeze moving forward for students. 
I want to ensure affordability for students. There is an affordability crisis in Ontario and across Canada right now. The cost of housing, the cost of food, the cost of gas. But what this government is doing is ensuring that post-secondary education is affordable for all students in this province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you very much. My question is to the Premier. To the Attorney, Gen the, the Attorney Gen General recently put two of the Premier's buddies onto the committee responsible for judicial appointments. Shockingly, when the Premier was asked about these appointments, he said that he wants to ensure that the committee is only Order. recommending conservative affiliated judges. He went so far as to suggest that if a judicial candidate had voted for the NDP or Liberals, that they are a threat to public safety. Painful. Speaker, yet it is on this Order. government's watch that our criminal justice system has spiraled into chaos. It's on this Premier's watch that our courtrooms are closed every day due to understaffing. It's on his watch that serious cases are routinely thrown out Order. or delayed. Will the Premier reverse his partisan appointments, or is he just comfortable further undermining public confidence in the justice system? Members will please take their seats and to respond. The Attorney General. Speaker, and, and I, I, I want to start. I want to start with the acknowledgement that only those that would always be political expect others to always be political, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's my obligation to make recommendations to the cabinet to appoint judges. I take that responsibility serious and seriously. And obviously, I want advice from those that I respect, Mr. Speaker. The advisory committee provides the advice, and it has more than two members on it. In fact, it has three judges on the committee. So I don't know if the member opposite is maligning all of the members of the committee or just the ones that she doesn't uh, agree with, which kind of is ironic given that she doesn't want their advice and she doesn't think we should have it. I take the committee's collective advice, Mr. Speaker, and the Liberal, the, the, these Liberals and Sandals over here, Mr. Speaker, are no different than these Liberals over here in that they want to appoint advisors for me. Shocking that a Conservative government wants to hear from Conservative voices, Mr. Speaker. As Brian Lilly said, they're only upset because they think they should still get to make the decisions, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Order. Order. Supplementary question. Back to the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Six years in power and the Conservatives are still making up excuses for the worsening crisis in our justice system. The Federation of Ontario Law Associations put out one of the more measured statements in response to the Premier's comments, saying that the Premier has a juvenile misapprehension of the judicial appointments and that his comments are irresponsible, harmful and dangerous to our democracy. Speaker. It is shocking that even our criminal justice system, even in that criminal justice system, the Premier's focus seems to be entirely on producing order. favors for his insiders. Government Many side people come to order. sitting across from me, Speaker, were given useless titles around King's Council. And now this government is putting unqualified friends into a position where they get to do Question. favors for more government conservative allies. Speaker, will the Premier reverse these appointments and apologize to the public and the legal community for their interference in the judicial appointments? To respond, order, order. The House will come to order. Stop the clock. Are we ready to continue? <laughs> Evidently not. Okay, start the clock. The Attorney General can reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
And I, and I have to say, Mr. Speaker, I, I was missing Mitzi Hunter's five-in-one question so that, I, so, that, so that I could address the successes of this government, but I'm glad to see the tradition continue, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that this government takes judicial appointments seriously. I, I, we have appointed 100 judicial positions, Mr. Speaker, and I would take, I would take exception if they, could, if they could even point to one that isn't qualified, Mr. Order. Speaker. We have a committee that's been in place since 1985. Mr. Speaker, it's been populated with Opposition volunteers and judges on. ever since, and we have a gold standard of appointments of judges, and that standard has continued. Only because the Toronto Star wrote a story are the NDP now paying attention, Mr. Speaker, and I am happy to, to go through every single one of the judicial appointments, and you will see that they are, Response. in fact, qualified. Mr. Speaker, the government, the, 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 you would think a government in waiting We'll have a little more, That's a little better scratch. understanding of how the system works, Mr. Speaker, but I'm afraid we don't. So we will continue with the high school. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to Associate Minister of Transportation. Many people living in my riding of Richmond Hill and across the GTA are are on public transit and the primary form of travel. The experience using public transit should be convenient and affordable. However, many of my constituents have voiced concerns over steep transit costs. Speaker, life is expensive and hardworking individuals and families across our province are already saying that it is very hard for them. Our government must continue to keep costs down for transit riders and deliver the financial relief that they deserve. Speaker, can the Associate Minister tell the House how our government is removing barriers to ridership and making Ontarians a travelling more affordable? The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order, and the member for Sault Ste. Marie will come to order. The Associate Minister of Transportation can report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member from Richmond Hill for that question. Mr. Speaker, let me be crystal clear. No government is doing more for transit riders than under the leadership of Premier Ford. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we are making public transit more accessible and affordable than ever before. And our $70 billion transit plan, we are building transit all across Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Starting today, our new one fare program will put more money back into people's pocket, and as double fares are now gone, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. On average, this is a saving of $1,600 every year, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Liberals couldn't do it, but under Premier Ford, we got it done. Yeah. Yeah. Supplementary question, back to the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response, and very thank you for the $70 billion transit plan. People in my riding of Richmond Hill and across the GTA will be excited to know that we have saved money when we're traveling starting today, Speaker. With, with affordability being a top priority for everyone in Ontario, it's surprising that the NDP and the individual Liberals voted against this program. Speaker, they voted against the saving transit riders of 1600 a year. That is shameful. Our government will continue to ensure that the public transportation system is making it easier, faster and cheaper for people to get where they need to go. Question. Speaker, can the minister provide further details on how the One Fair program will make this easier for people in Ontario? To reply, the associate minister. Mr. Speaker, while Bonnie Crombie hiked my way transit fare year over year in Nisaga, I was really disappointed that Liberals and NDP chose to play political games rather than supporting one fair program. Mr. Speaker, this is a kind of program that makes a significant impact and differences on people's lives. But Liberals and NDP, they were against saving transit riders $1,600 every year. They voted not just once, Mr. Speaker, they voted against twice. 
And Mr. Speaker, starting today, as I said, commuters simply use the same card to tap, to transfer from one, one uh, transit agencies to another transit agencies, and that's going to save them more money so they can save their money towards their future, to their children, or for their most important things like a grocery, Response. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are the only party that is working to eliminate barriers and make life more affordable yeah. under the leadership of Premier yeah. Dr. Hey. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Premier. In December, the Ontario Energy Board decided to protect Enbridge gas customers from unreasonable rate increases for new gas line installation. We're talking about $300 per customer over the next four years. The next day, the Premier's Minister of Energy said he would bring in a bill to overturn the decision and crank up the gas bills. Will the Premier protect gas customers from higher Enbridge charges? To reply to the government, the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, since day one, we've been focused on ensuring that we have a reliable, affordable, clean energy system in this province. It's remarkable for me, Mr. Speaker, to hear the energy critic from the NDP now standing up and championing gas in our province when at every opportunity he has slammed the use of natural gas. Not just slammed the use of natural gas, Mr. Speaker, but he's also slammed our nuclear sector, Mr. Speaker. What we have done by introducing the bill last week, and we'll debate it at second reading today, Mr. Speaker, is ensure that there's at least one party in this legislature that's standing up for homeowners and new homeowners and energy customers, and that is Premier Ford and the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. They can be beholden to the environmental groups. They can be beholden to those who are ideological. We're not going to do that. We're going to stand up for the people of Ontario. Restart the clock. The supplementary question back to the member for Toronto. Well, Speaker, again to the Premier. And the question is pretty simple. I'm sure Order. even the minister can understand it. Millions of Ontarians are having trouble paying their bills. Will the Premier support lower gas bills for customers or will he protect higher profits for Enbridge? What will he choose? Simple question. Minister of Energy. This is like Twilight Zone stuff here, Mr. Speaker, that this member is standing up for gas customers when he's wanted to shut down natural gas right across the province. Mr. Speaker, there's one party in this legislature that is standing up for those who want to enter the home market. They want to buy a home in this province. That's this party, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Energy Board's decision from just before Christmas would have driven up the price of a home by, at minimum, $4,400, Mr. Speaker. Our party won't stand for that, but in parts of rural Ontario, it was going to drive up the cost by tens of thousands of dollars a year, Mr. Speaker. We are in a housing crisis in this province. Every time our party brings forward plans, like the Housing Supply Action Plans, it's the NDP that stands up against it, Mr. Speaker. And this is the latest example of Order. the NDP and the Liberals and the Greens standing up against the ability for people to buy a home in our province. We're going to stand with those who want to get into housing, Mr. Speaker, and sure we're keeping shovels in the ground in Ontario. The next question, the member for Niagara West. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Under the leadership of the previous Liberal gov government, we saw Ontario garner a reputation as an extremely high-cost jurisdiction. Companies that had set up shop left in droves, and international businesses overlooked Ontario as a potential jurisdiction in which to expand and grow and add jobs. But since taking office, our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, has recognized the importance of building a resilient manufacturing sector, and we've made sure that these jobs are being created in every corner of this province. Speaker, could the minister provide an update to the House on some of the manufacturing investments we welcomed in Niagara since the beginning of the year? Whoa. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, our government recognizes just how important the manufacturing sector is in our economy. Already this year, 
We've welcomed $65 million in investment in Niagara region alone. Stanpak manufactures food, dairy and beverage packaging for global businesses. They invested $35 million to retool their facility in Smithville. AMSI, a company that designs and constructs support buildings for on-site developments, they invested $20 million to construct a 67,000-square-foot manufacturing facility in Beamsville. And St. David's Cold Storage invested $9 million to expand their cold storage facility for food and beverage manufacturers. Speaker, they created a total of 46 good-paying jobs with $6.7 million in investment support from our government. Stay tuned, Speaker. The game-changing investments are just starting. Here, here. The supplementary question. Back to member for Niagara West. Minister, for the answer and also the work he is doing to attract good paying jobs to Niagara and to every corner of this province. It's great to hear that new good paying job manufacturing jobs are being created in our province following years of news about manufacturing jobs, some 300,000 of them fleeing Ontario under the Liberal government. In fact, manufacturing employment in Ontario is now at one of the highest levels it has been since 2008. It is a testament to the measures our government has taken to cut red tape, slash taxes, and get our economy back on track while rebuilding the manufacturing sector. So, Speaker, could the minister share more about how these manufacturing investments are coming to Ontario? Well said. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Again, Speaker, this is such an historic number that it bears repeating. In 2023, Ontario created more manufacturing jobs than all 50 U.S. states combined. In the last three years, Ontario has attracted more than $29 billion in new manufacturing investments, creating more than 11,000 new jobs in that sector. This year, it, Ontario welcomed an investment from a Kitchener-based medtech firm, Fluid AI. They're investing $25 million, hiring 38 new technicians with a $1.4 million investment from our, from our government. This investment, Speaker, will strengthen our world-class manufacturing sector and create Response. jobs for hardworking families in Ontario. We have continued to create the right conditions for job growth in every region of the province. Thank you, Speaker. Students at Ontario's provincial schools are some of the most vulnerable students in our province, yet they are being forced to learn in horrific conditions. There are allegations of abuse, discrimination and neglect, a serious teacher shortage, crumbling school buildings and absurd emergency response plans. These schools are the direct responsibility of the Minister of Education. He could change things today if he wanted to. Students, parents, alumni, teachers and advocates have been begging him for years to act. Will the minister finally take action and do something to protect these children? To apply, the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I do thank the member opposite for the question. We do agree these are the most exceptional children within our care. It's why this government has announced an $8.6 million investment to enhance and renew the facilities that lodge these kids. It's why the government actually appointed inspectors to ensure compliance. It's why this government announced a permanent executive director and a clinical manager and a new lodging policy that enhances safety through regulation. So we are committed to being and investing in supporting these kids, recognizing there's about 520 kids within our care and 610 staff that we have in place. We'll continue to support them and provide compassion and hope and opportunity and training for these, uh, these children whom I visited at these homes, at these various lodging and schools across Ontario. We are committed to their success, Speaker. Since the minister seems unaware of what's happening in these schools on his watch, let's talk about their record. A school with deaf students and deaf staff using a cowbell as the emergency alert system. Students having class in the bathroom because it's the only place warm enough to take off their mittens and they need to use their hands to communicate. Students only getting assessments if their parents hire a lawyer or complain to their MPP. 
two class action lawsuits in the past 10 years, with the province paying $23 million in settlements, and yet there are currently no less than three new lawsuits filed or pending. Is this a record that the minister is proud of? What is it going to take for him to finally act? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the concerns cited by the member opposite underscore why the government invested $8.6 million to enhance the facilities for those kids. It's why the government uh, did not defend the actions of the former Liberal government. We actually initiated the hiring of inspectors to ensure compliance. It's why the government announced a permanent executive director to support those kids, and we hired a clinical manager with a new, tougher lodging policy imposed by regulation. And you know, This shouldn't be a political matter. I understand these kids are are very vulnerable, they need our support. But the, you talk about a track record. The member opposite will need to explain to those families why you oppose the funding to enhance those lodges, Order. why you oppose the increase in special education funding Order. for those kids, why you oppose the hiring of 3,200 EAs to help the most vulnerable in our schools. But, Mr. Speaker, while they'll have to explain that to the families Response. of this province, we'll continue to invest and support the success of the most exceptional kids within our care. The next question, the member for Order, the member for Ottawa South. To the Premier. Speaker, we know that the Premier makes sure that wealthy, well-connected friends are taken care of. Whether it's the $8.3 billion backroom deal to carve up the Greenbelt or secret sole source contracts for Thermae and Staples, ministerial zoning orders for land speculators, or as the Premier has said himself, appointments for insiders and friends. And the Premier's latest two insider appointments are to the panel that appoints Ontario's judges. That's not the worst part, folks. It's that the Premier says that their job is to appoint like-minded judges. Like-minded judges. So, Speaker, I just need to know, why does the Premier think it's a good idea to appoint Order. judges who think like him while his office is the subject of an RCMP criminal investigation. Order. To reply, the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, and I guess the Liberals are feeling left out, and I actually thought they would keep their heads down on this kind of issue, Mr. Speaker. Their record of appointments is abysmal and irresponsible, Mr. Speaker. That the former chair of the exact same committee was a Liberal donor and supporter, along with several other members of the same committee. Now, no, here's the thing, Mr. Speaker. That doesn't bother me. That doesn't bother me at all, Mr. Speaker. What bothers me is the hypocrisy of the other side. The member has to withdraw the unparliamentary comment. We conclude. What bothers me, Mr. Speaker, is the inconsistency of the other side in trying to avoid transparency. They're, they're, they're mostly upset because something was said out loud that they want buried, Mr. Speaker. The, the, we were elected. Look, we're, we're not just on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. We're on that side of the House, Mr. Speaker. Our majority sits over there. And Mr. Speaker, we have an obligation to the public to make appointments in the interest of the public, Mr. Speaker. We will listen to Conservative voices and we will make responsible appointments. Order. The supplementary question. None of this is a surprise, Speaker. This is the same Premier who wanted to appoint a close personal friend as the Commissioner of the OPP. So, Ontarians don't need like-minded judges. They need fair-minded judges who apply the law in an unbiased and unpartisan way, Premier. That's the Canadian way. We don't Order. elect judges, Speaker. Order. We're not the U.S. Politicians don't get to stack the courts, Premier. This is so Canadians Order. don't have trust in Order. their judicial system. And what the Premier says he Government has side, to do, just simply by saying it, is eroding trust in the people's courts. So, Speaker, through you, will the Premier do the right thing, rescind these two appointments, and stop his interference with the independence of our courts? Yeah. To respond, the Premier. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I find it ironic, and I actually have no problem with it. Many years ago, 30 years ago, I, I met a former Speaker called Chris Stockwell. And he said, never ever criticize the opposition for appointed, appointing people like-minded. You know, Mr. Speaker, we have a massive crime wave right now happening in our cities, right across Toronto and the GTA. 
Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, they're kicking doors in. They're putting guns to people's heads, and guess what happens, Mr. Speaker? They get out on bail. Then they go do it again, and then they get out on bail again, and then they get out on bail. They've been out on bail Order. eight times, and I guarantee you, if I ask Order. the students up there, if they they're aware of their houses being broken into, their cars are being broken into, they're terrified to stay at home by themselves. Response. They want to go everywhere their parents go because they're terrified. So I am going to make sure we have like-minded judges being. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. Start the clock. The next question. The member for Flamborough, Glanbrook. Thank you, and good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Oh, my goodness. Mr. Speaker, our government will always be on the side of parents who want their kids to stay in class. Speaker. The data is clear. Children excel when they are in school consistently. Literacy rates have increased across all grade levels, and math has either stabilized or improved. Nice. We know that the minister is determined to land deals that keep kids learning and ensure that families across our province receive the stability they deserve. Speaker, through you to the minister, how is our government working to keep children learning and ensure that Ontario families benefit from a renewed focus on academic achievement? Wow. Minister of Education. Speaker, thank you to the member from Flamborough Glanbrook for this question. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to announce in this House for the first time since we last rose ahead of the holidays that our government has landed deals with the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario and the French Teachers Union, which represents over a million children having peace and stability in their lives for the next three years. Mr. Speaker, as our government goes back to the basics of ensuring foundational learning, we can now provide a sense of certainty to families that their children will be in school learning with their educators, with their friends, with the stimulus of extracurriculars and, um, and clubs and sports. All of this is important to producing a well-rounded student that graduates with a competitive advantage as we help them ensure they've got the skills to get a good paying job. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to stability for families and we will stand up for children and their families to keep them in school right to June. Supplementary, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the Minister. Speaker, children across our province are benefiting from our government's unapologetic focus on boosting literacy, STEM, and skilled trades. Math achievement is trending upward across all grade levels in both English and French. The evidence is clear. If we want kids to succeed in the long term, we need to start early. Speaker, will the minister outline our government's plan to support our youngest students and strengthen learning on what actually matters to parents and the job market? Well said. <laughs> Minister of Education. Thank you again to the member from Flamborough Glanbrook for this important question, her leadership on this file. Mr. Speaker, we recognize stability is key, and today, because of our government's leadership, three in four students have that certainty with no strikes on the horizon for the next three years as we go back to basics and, and really emphasize academic achievement as the foremost priority of our school boards. Mr. Speaker, our plan to get back to basics and back on track is working. Ontario has the second in the nation in reading and writing and math. We have the top 10 in science in internationally and top 15 in math globally. Mr. Speaker, but to build on this, we recognize we have to start early, which is why the parliamentary assistant, the Minister of Education and Health joined me to announce that we are introducing a new kindergarten curriculum that will in, in require mandatory, explicit daily instruction in literacy and in math supported by the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to ensuring kids learn life and job skills that will allow them to get a good paying job, own Response. a home and achieve the dream of this country. We're going to continue to invest and support back to basics in Ontario schools. The next question, the member from Mishkigawak, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government recently refused 
amendments the NDP proposed for Working for Workers Bill 149 that would have properly reclassified wildland forest rangers as for, for, uh, firefighters, making them eligible for the same presumptive cancer coverage as all other firefighters. There are many studies showing that people who fight forest fires are exposed to dangerous chemicals, and yet this government denies these workers access to the same support available to structural forest fire. My question, will, wildland, will with wildfire season anticipated to start early this year, will the government finally do the right thing and classify forest rangers as for firefighters? Of labor, immigration training, and skills development. Thank you, Speaker. A short answer to the member opposite: Yes, Speaker. We look forward, as we've done multiple times in session, to implement working for workers legislation. And I appreciate uh, the input from all members of this place. You know, Speaker. Let's not forget it's this government that's expanded presumptive coverage for thyroid, for pancreatic, and now esophageal cancer. When that party opposite held the balance of power and could have pushed the Liberals to do something about it, they didn't. But Mr. Speaker, Premier Ford and our government are, and, and Speaker, I would, uh, I, would, I would appreciate the member opposite. Uh, you know, he can work like other members in his caucus, work with us, and add these expanded coverages, and I look forward to working with him to do just that. Thank you. Yeah. A supplementary question, the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. The government received a Joint Health and Safety Committee recommendation pointing to the failure of the ministry to acknowledge well-known and serious health risks to forest firefighters. Forest firefighters are exposed to silicas, benzenes, formaldehyde, poison ivy smoke, carbon monoxide, and dump fires riddled with carcinogens. And yet, Unbelievably, forest firefighters are told that all they need to protect themselves from toxins is a homemade bandana. Wow. Does this government seriously believe this is an acceptable standard of worker health and safety? Mr. Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I'm very grateful for the heroic work of firefighters. We've worked closely with the OPFFA. <laughs> and so many others, and we had members, firefighter families in this place just last week, Speaker. We're going to continue working, working with them. That member is seriously late to everything, Speaker. This government's taken action, as I said, thyroid, pancreatic, esophageal, so much more. We've reformed WSIB, which, quite frankly, when, when that party held the balance of power and when that party was uh, for the one time that they'll ever have in government in Ontario, Speaker, a WSIB was a mess. Yeah. A speaker, we're working with WSIB, working with the heroic uh, frontline responders, and and we implemented the Skills Development Fund, things that members done nothing to support to expand Indigenous fire Response. training, to support men and women um, who are serving on the front lines, will always have their back, with or without that member. I hope she'll work with us on this speaker, and I look forward to Thank you. The next question, the member for? Nope. Member for Sarnia Lambton is next. Speaker, and, uh, my question is for the Minister of Northern Development. Speaker, the Northern agri food industry keeps our communities thriving. For 15 years, the critical industry was ignored by the previous Liberal government. Instead of supporting workers in the North, they insulted them by calling Northern Ontario, quote, a no man's land. Terrible. Speaker, our government recognizes the value of agriculture and food sector in Northern Ontario as it boosts the local economy and creates great employment opportunities. That's why we need to continue to make targeted investments that will boost local food production and sim stimulate expansion and diversification in the northern agri-food sector. Speaker, can the minister tell this House what steps this government is taking to ensure that the agri-food sector stays competitive in northern Ontario? Here, here. Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank the member from Sarnia Lambton for his decades of ad advocacy. He's a great colleague to work with, and I appreciate him very much. Wait. On the heels of the Beef Farmers of Asso uh, Association of Ontario's AGM uh, and the uh, great speech from the Minister of Agriculture, I was there to remind the beef farmers of our unequivocal 
uh, support for beef farming in Northern Ontario. This is a growing agri-food sector, Mr. Speaker. We had lots of examples to draw from. I mentioned the Penokean Hills Cooperative, a group uh, comprised of Northern producers who sell and market beef products to build a finishing yard in the old Thessalon Airport, responding for locally uh, uh, grown food. I also uh, reminded them of, the, of an investment for the Riv Rainy River Cattlemen's Association out in my riding, Kenora Rainy River, where to the tune of almost a million dollars, the Premier and I announced an investment for their sales barn, which turns more than $10 million of beef sales a year out in the beautiful beginning of the prairies. Mr. Speaker, they were pleased and understood that our government stands poised to support agri-food in Northern Ontario. If Response. Supply chain Mr. Speaker, and we know that Northern Ontario can be the next big frontier for agri-food production in Ontario. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for that great response. It's great to hear that our government is focusing on supporting the agri-food sector and livestock producers in the North. Unfortunately, the people of Northern Ontario are no strangers to the ne negative impacts of reckless policies put in place by previous Liberal governments. While the Liberals killed hundreds of thousands of jobs, our government is not only bringing those jobs back, but we're continuing to invest in innovation in the agri-food sector and with livestock producers. By supporting agricultural research and innovation, we can increase this production and consumption of locally grown food in Northern Ontario and throughout this province. Speaker, can the minister again explain what our government is doing to increase food security and to ensure that Northern Ontario's agriculture sec sector continues to thrive? <clears throat> Mr. Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It isn't just that the previous Liberal government thought that Northern Ontario was no man's land. They made life more expensive, and their federal cousins continue to do that. On the other hand, Mr. Speaker, our party is ensuring that the uh, right investments are being made to strengthen the supply chain for agri-food production across Northern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I spoke at the Northern Ontario Farm Innovation Alliance to announce thousands of new acres of tile drainage in the Temiskaming and Cochrane districts, Mr. Speaker, as well as in the Manitoulin Island regions. These are essential for creating arable land for livestock uh, and other uh, crop production, Mr. Speaker. It's absolutely essential that they have the tools they need to become a major player in agri-food sector production for the province of Ontario and beyond its borders, but also for the new demand, the new rage, if you will, Mr. Speaker, to have locally gr grown food that's more affordable, Mr. Speaker, and it meets the test of food Response. security food sovereignty locally that everyone in Northern Ontario is asking for. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For months now, we've been warning that the rollout of affordable child care is at a crisis point. The YMCA has been ringing alarm bells at pre-budget hearings across the province, warning of intimate closures in child care centres if this government doesn't step up to provide adequate resources. Despite countless operators asking for an adjusted funding formula and others pulling out of the program, this government's operating funding to child care programs is lower than it was in 2018. Will the government commit to immediately implementing a full cost recovery model to ensure parents can access affordable childcare in this province? Mr. Of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are proud as a government, as a progressive Conservative Party, to have cut childcare fees by 50 per cent for working families in this province, saving anywhere between eight and ten thousand dollars per child. Now, the NDP cannot have it both ways. The NDP is on the record urging this government to sign the first deal available that would have omitted $3 billion for those operators, that would have omitted for-profit childcare in London and in communities across the province. A third of our operators are for-profit because of an ideological aversion to a small business, often a woman who, a woman who runs a for-profit childcare operator. We are advocating to the federal Liberal government to demand more funding for our operators. Why don't you get on board and support this government and stand up for all operators and all families in this province. The supplementary question back to the member for London Fanshawe. We have an unworkable funding model and a workforce crisis in the child care sector. Parents need affordable child care now, and instead of 
taking action to help this government cut $85 million in funding. Ontario could have a decent workforce, fair wages for ECEs and childcare workers, and addressed a staffing shortage in this province with an equal funding partner. We must ensure families have equitable options for childcare. The best way to do that is by instating a full cost recovery model. Will the minister finally take action to ensure families can get access to timely childcare in this province? Minister, do it for the kids. Order. I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The minister of Education. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, for the member's uh, passionate advocacy on this matter. I will remind her and her party and the Liberals that when the Liberal Party was last in power, child care rose by over 400 per cent. That was an unacceptable reality for working families, and this government got to power, negotiated a materially better deal for the families we represent. And unlike the members opposite, who wanted us to, who wanted us to oppose for-profit childcare, who wanted us to oppose uh, advocating for respecting the way parents raise their kids, we fought and delivered a better deal and cut fees by 50 percent, and are building 86,000 net new spaces. Now, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to reduce fees. We're going to continue to create spaces and we're going to continue to urge the federal liberal government to step up with funding to support our operators support Response. our parents support our kids because all families will benefit from affordable child care in this province speaker the next question the member for newmarket aurora thank you speaker my question is for the minister of environment conservation and parks Speaker, environmental assessments are critical to getting infrastructure projects built and repaired quickly while protecting our nature. Unfortunately, the environmental assessment process was severely neglected under the previous Liberal government. Imagine people would have to wait until a hydro pole fell down or broke to have it replaced due to excessive red tape. Now that's unacceptable, Speaker. Our government must continue to eliminate this type of excessive red tape that was left behind by the Liberals and keep getting shovels in the ground faster to meet the needs of people across our great province. Speaker, can the minister please share how this government is improving Question. the environmental assessment process to save time and resources while securing environmental outcomes? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to that member for that question. She's absolutely correct. It's, we simply had a process that allowed decaying hydro poles to, to collapse without being able to fix them right away. It's ridiculous. And that's the, frankly ridiculous and, and dangerous. And that's because such things were mired in bureaucracy and red tape under the Liberal government. We know the opposition is okay to maintain the status quo, which you know, drives up the cost of living and does absolutely nothing for the environment. But this is why we've been working hard under the leadership of this Premier to modernize a more than 50-year-old environmental assessment process. This is in response from calls from municipalities and communities that were frustrated that critical infrastructure projects were being caught up in unnecessary bureaucracy. Fonts. Through extensive consultation with municipalities, Indigenous communities, our officials were able to identify projects that no, with known outcomes and processes so that these projects can get done quicker for all here, of here. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. It is great to see our government bring forward changes that will protect world-class environmental standards while helping get shovels in the ground sooner. As our population continues to grow, we must ensure we have the transportation network and infrastructure needed to build a better Ontario. It is equally important to complete these projects in an environmentally responsible manner with community's interests in mind. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is protecting strong environmental oversight and making it faster to build in Ontario? Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Well, thank you, Speaker. 
And the member is referring to such projects as highways, railways, and transmission lines that are going to be subjects to streamlined assessment. These will allow us to focus our resources on projects that have a greater potential of environmental impact. Speaker, construction methods have come a long way in the last 50 years. The way my ministry does environmental assessments have come a long way in 50 years, and it's time the process itself was brought up to date as well. Speaker, it's not only just this change where we're helping and listening to Ontarians, but it's also part of our initiative to exempt regulations to create uh, to streamline environmental assessment for Indigenous land claims as well and Indigenous settlements. This regulation will help resolve historic land claims more quickly by providing a single yet robust process for First Nations to settle these important claims. More recently, our government has also removed the unnecessary yet mandatory 30-day wait period on routine projects. This is one change that will allow municipalities to build roads, bridges Response. and water treatment facilities faster. Under leadership of this Premier and this government, our, we will make sensible, practical changes that will ensure strong environment and practical. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mount. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In 2019, your government made sweeping changes to our public health system without consulting public health. Fast forward to 2023, and the Auditor General's general our value for money audit shows clearly a lack of funding, a lack of funding which has serious risks to our communities. Our Hamilton lab completes over 300,000 tests a year, and now Hamilton, as well as five other public health labs, will be closing their doors. Premier, your government is once again putting our community at risk. When are you going to respect our local public health units and fund them appropriately? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. The member opposite, of course, is talking about a recommendation made by the Auditor General. There has been no decision made by the Ministry or Public Health Ontario. But to suggest in any way that we have not been funding our public health partners is a complete fallacy, and the numbers prove it out. We have, since 2020, 2021, invested over $100 million for infection prevention and control hubs to support over 5,000 congregate living settings across the province. That's something that your government, when you were in government, when you were supporting the Liberals, never happened. We'll continue to support public health because we understand understand how absolutely critical it is. Now, in last year's AMO conference, we announced that we would continue to support an increase with public health units across Ontario and support voluntary mergers if they deemed them appropriate for their community. I must caution the Minister of Health on her choice of wording. Supplementary question. Speaker, sustainable funding and one-dime funding is not the same. Our public health units are at risk because of their cuts in, in, our, in our public there, health. There. Speaker, 300,000 tests a year, tests like RSV, C. difficile, HV, uh, HIV, and free testing for people with private drinking water systems like wells and cisterns. Tests for water that might be contaminated with bacteria, West Nile virus, E. coli. Do I need to remind this government of Walkerton? Yes, you do. Speaker, all of these tests are on the chopping block for Hamilton. Wow. Premier, once again, your government is putting our communities at risk. When will you put people's health and safety first and reverse these cuts and closures? Here, here. The Minister of Health. Oh, Speaker, I think we just experienced in live time NDP math. Yep. Since 2018, <laughs> public health units have increased funding from the provincial government by 16 per cent. That is separate and apart from all of the COVID-related expenses that public health happened. You know, Speaker, with the greatest of respect, facts matter. Look at the estimates, look at the budgets, and see the investments we've made. Again, 16 per cent since Premier Ford began forming government in 2018. Order. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Our government is committed to advancing reconciliation and listening to Indigenous partners and leaders. Speaker, 
fees for death records of children who attended residential schools in Ontario and for reclaiming traditional names are unjust. We need to reduce the burden for Indigenous communities, organizations and family members who are trying to access records and services. Our government must continue to take meaningful action to ensure supports are available at every step of the journey towards healing for Indigenous communities. Speaker, through you. Can the minister please tell this House what our government is doing to make it easier and more affordable for Indigenous people in Ontario to access vital government services? Thank you. The Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the excellent member for Carleton for that question. I am very pleased to confirm that our progressive Conservative government, as of January 2024, will be permanently waiving fees for changing names for residential school survivors and their families aiming to reclaim traditional names altered by the residential school system. As part of this initiative, fees are also waived for registering a delayed registration of death for children who were enrolled in, in residential schools. Additionally, this government is permanently eliminating fees for death registration searches, certificates, and certified copies of death registrations. These permanent fee waivers are providing ongoing financial relief for impacted Indigenous communities and families during an already difficult time, Mr. Speaker. And also, under the leadership of our Premier, the Honourable Doug Ford, our Progressive Conservative Government will always stand by our First Nations communities by taking meaningful action that ensures support every step of the way toward reconciliation. Question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you, thank you to the Minister for his response. This announcement marks an important step in moving along the path of reconciliation and provides financial relief for Indigenous communities. Speaker, we know that Indigenous and Northern communities face unique challenges in accessing government records and services. It is our government's ongoing responsibility to address their concerns. That's why we must continue to provide support that is flexible and responsive to their needs. I know we have worked with Service Ontario over the years to reduce barriers and improve services. Through you, Speaker, can the minister please explain what initiatives our government has put forward to make services more accessible in remote and Indigenous communities? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Business Service Delivery. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Carleton again for this supplementary question. I am proud to say that Ontario was the first jurisdiction in Canada to explicitly allow for a birth to be registered with a single name or for a person to change one's name to a single name. These changes build on recent initiatives by my ministry that provide easier access to government services in remote and Indigenous communities. In July 2022, Service Ontario and the North Shore Tribal Council worked collaboratively to launch the first Indigenous-led Service Ontario Centre at the, Ser the Serpent River Trading Post in Cutler to deliver photocard, driver's license vehicle, and health care and other health care cards and other services. Then in October 2022, Spons. we launched the first mobile service unit within the Robinson Huron Treaty area, and then Pickle Lake, November 2023, restored uh, services at the municipal office there. Very proud to be there with the member opposite representing that. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Ottawa South has given notice of their dissatisfaction with the answer to the question given by the Attorney General regarding judicial appointments. This matter will be debated tomorrow following private members' public business. Also, pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Ottawa West Nepean has given notice of their dissatisfaction with the answer to their question given by the Minister of Education regarding provincial schools. This matter will be debated Wednesday following private members' public business. Also, pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Toronto Centre has given notice of their dissatisfaction with the answer to their question given by the Attorney General regarding judicial appointments. This matter will be debated Wednesday following private members' public business. I understand the member for Ottawa South has a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I just want to address the Attorney, uh, in his, the Attorney General's response uh, and his remarks about the former member from Scarborough-Guildwood. 
And I would just hope, Speaker, that once we've all left here. Thank you. It's not, it's, a, it's not a valid point of order. Order. We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 13, an act to enact the Northern Health Travel Grant Advisory Committee Act 2022. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.